Hold on, you can start over again. I don't need to start over again. <laughs> well, that's okay. Ooh, boy, is it loud enough now? Holy cow. Can we have a, a word of prayer together first? Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for giving me the privilege to be here and speak to your people. Lord, you've been working with me for a long time. And I wish I could say I've arrived, but you and I know better. You've had to convince me that I was living for myself in ways I don't even stop and think. And you laid out my heart. I need to stop living for myself. So this morning, Lord, as you know, I'm sharing what you've given to me. For I pray in Jesus' name that you will speak to each and every heart. For I ask it, amen. amen. Stop living for ourselves. Many of us would say, well, I haven't. Uh, I've, I've been baptized and uh, I've joined the church and, and uh, I go to church every Saturday and... and uh, you know, I don't eat things I'm not supposed to. and Yeah, that sounds familiar. But, you know, God takes us where we are and says, I'm so glad you're here. But he never leaves us where we are. Amen. Never. He's always going to want you to continue to progress. And I can, I'm living testimony of that. Some of you have never saw the movie a few good men. But you're probably familiar with one scene. Cruz plays a military lawyer who is interrogating tough guy Jack Nicholas, and Cruz isn't really getting anywhere, and finally he shouts out, I want the truth. And Jack Nicholas shouts back and says, You can't stand the truth. You can't handle it. Some of you have seen that pop movie. Some of you haven't. Truth is difficult. Sometimes it's really hard to handle. I know it is for me sometimes. But here goes. In Ezekiel, God tells me something. And I was amazed because I'd read this many times, but I never really caught it before. If you warn the righteous people, hello, isn't that you and me? We think of it so many times, if we warn the sinner, right? But that isn't what it says. If we war warn or warn the righteous people and the people do not sin, they will listen to you and they will not sin. They will live and you will have saved yourself too. I was amazed at that, and the Lord brought me back to it because, you know, I'm thinking, hey, as a retired pastor and evangelist, and I've taught more lessons than I can remember, I mean, I already know all this, right? But isn't it funny how every time you read, you find something new, Amen. and it speaks more and more to you. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians, we speak a message approved by God. To be trusted with the good news. Our purpose is to please God, not people. He alone examines the emotives of the heart. And in Galatians, he says, obviously, I'm not trying to get the approval of people, but God. 
If pleasing people was my goal, I would not be Christ's servant. That's quite a thing, isn't it? If you're trying to please people, are you really Christ's servant? You know, sometimes we do things or say things, a little compromise, when really we shouldn't, you know. I listened to a, a message on no guile. We read, you know, it said the 145,000 and there's no guile. With Nathaniel, he said, there is a real Israelite with no guile. I got to thinking about that and I listened to what the speaker said. And boy, was he talking to me. Sometimes we can be able to do something, say something, even be quiet where we ought to speak. And really, we're not being honest as far as Christ is concerned. Isaiah tells us this. All of us. Did that leave anybody out? All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own way. And yet, the Lord laid upon him the sins of all of us. And sins that maybe when you were first baptized like me, you didn't even realize you had them. You know, maybe when you first baptized, you know, I had, to, oh, well, I got four I got to work on. You know, I actually had nine. And it was amazing that I decided, oh, I better go to work on them. But I want to amaze you, tell you something, that doesn't work. A famous actor was an after-dinner speaker at a big meeting. And when it was his time to stand up, he asked the people to choose a poem that he could recite. There was total silence. And after a while, a retired preacher stood up and said, recite Psalms 23. Well, that kind of shook the actor up a little bit. But he says, all right, I'll do it if you agree to do it after me. And so the pastor said, well, okay. So he recited the 23rd Psalm. And when he had finished, he got a standing ovation for he had recited the lines. Then the pastor stood up and he said, the Lord is my shepherd and I have all that I need. He leads me into green meadows and he leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength and he guides me along the right paths, bringing honor to his name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect me and comfort me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with your blessings. Surely, goodness and mercy will be with me and unfailing will pursue me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. When the pastor finished speaking, there was not a dry eye in the place. You see, the difference was the actor recited lines, and he recited his heart. That's what God wants. He wants our hearts, all of it, not some of it. You know, and in many cases where I'm concerned, he's had to show me what that really means. I ask myself, where am I feeling? What am I doing wrong? Like I said, I go to church, you know, when I can, every Saturday, okay? And, uh, you know, I don't eat things I'm not supposed to and go places I'm not supposed to. And I, I keep the, all these things. Hmm. Did you notice in there, I, I, I? Like I said, I had nine things I went to work on them. I want to remind you something, though, that I found out. In my strength, I can't do anything. All of my promises are nothing but ropes of sand. Maybe you've found a similar problem in your life. And I know 
Some people say, Jack, you're talking to the choir. But remember Ezekiel said, if you tell the righteous. You see, God loves us all. And if we've accepted Jesus, we are righteous in Jesus' gate. And, you know, we talk about perfection. Will we ever truly be perfect? Not until Jesus actually comes. But do you know you are perfect when you kneel down and sincerely ask God to forgive you, you are perfect. And now like me, you mess up again. All right? So it is possible to be perfect in Jesus Christ. And that's what he wants for us. He wants us to be perfect as our Father is perfect. So I have a question. Are we managing our time? Have you thought about it? Or is time managing us? I'm speaking to me. Does it seem to just stand still? Or is it just going bye-bye? We have time to do what we want to do for ourselves. I know people who spend all day long doing nothing but watching sports. My (laughs) father-in-law used to have two TVs in his front room, and on one he'd have football, and the other he'd have baseball, watching them both at the same time. He was a sports nut. And yet he was a Christian. So when we think about it, what is it we have time to do? What do we spend our time on? Some people watch lots of TV or play games or on their iPads or iPhones or on Facebook and we can spend lots of time on those not even thinking about it. We just go through. Some of us spend entirely too much time working. Now some because we like it. Some because we want to make more money. We'll work overtime so we can get more money, get a better car, a bigger house. We'll work, work, work. And we're so consumed with working, what else do we do? I want to give you some advice from the wisest man that ever lived, except for Jesus. Wisdom and money can get you almost anything. But only wisdom can save your life. Riches won't help you in the day of judgment, but right living can save you from death. Tainted wealth has no lasting value, but right living can save your life. Don't wear yourself out trying to get rich. Be wise enough to know when to quit. In the blink of an eye, all the wealth can be goodbye, can be taken away. It can disappear. If you don't believe that, you need to pay attention to the news today, okay? Folks, it's going to all be gone. And guess what? It can also burn up with you. Don't spend all your time trying to get money. So my next question is, how much time do we spend with God? And only you can answer that between you and him. And you might as well be honest because he knows, you know. And it's amazing. We pray so little and normally we pray for something we want or need. And we'll get up and say, well, I'll read the Bible tomorrow, but right now I'm late. I got to go. Somebody will ask you, can you teach me some of the things in the Bible? Oh, yes, but not right now. I don't have time. How do we spend our time? You know, do we go and after Sabbath, do we go and eat our lunch and then sit down and go to your iPhone? Do you spend time on Facebook? You know, I'm glad you can say no. I used to. I couldn't say no. I can today. No, I'm not going to spend time doing that. 
What do we do with our time, folks? Is God really important? Is he really number one? I told my wife when I first met her, I says, I want to make one thing perfectly clear. God's number one, and you're number two. Now, at first she didn't like that, but now she reminds me all the time, you say I'm the most important thing on the earth. How come you didn't do it? Or why didn't you say this? Or how come you said that? See, I got a good reminder. Well, guess what? God's a good reminder too. If we really stop and listen to what he's telling us, but you've got to be able to listen. You've got to be able to know. Jesus' brother says, if you need wisdom, ask our generous God, and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. Prayer is us talking to God. Reading the scriptures is God talking to us. Do we read the Bible because, well, I need to be able to read a verse today or a chapter or whatever it is? Or do we read to be able to say, I really want to know God? Because knowing God is the only thing that's going to, going to get me into heaven. Why do we read it? Do you sit down and read it for yourself? Or do you sit down to show brother so-and-so he's wrong? Or sister so-and-so that she's got doesn't have the right idea? Not, that's not a good reason to study, folks. Study for yourself. A matter of fact, I think Paul even said that to his son Timothy. I think I've got the scripture here. We are fortunate as a people to not only have the Bible, but we've got a lesser light to lead us to the Bible and to help us understand some of the more difficult things that are there. But don't read the books without reading the book. I'm not saying the books aren't good, hello. But listen, if you're reading Desire of Ages, and I wished everybody would read it, look up every scripture. Read the one before it and the one after it. Make sure it wasn't taken out of context. You might even want to keep notes. But I'll tell you what, if you do that, you'll have a closer relationship with Jesus. Do you really spend time with God? Do you really want to know what he thinks? Or are you satisfied with what you think you think? Or what you think you know? Yes, Paul said to Timothy, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of God. We need to do this for ourselves. And it's a personal thing, folks. The only thing that'll get you to heaven is a relationship with Jesus Christ and the Father, the God of all the universe. That's the only thing that'll get you to heaven. It ain't none of that rest of the stuff. All of that right stuff ain't getting you to heaven if you're not doing it for the right reason. See, going to church ain't going to save you. Reading the Bible ain't going to save you. Don't eating certain things isn't going to save you. If you don't wear certain things, that's not going to save you. If you're not doing it because you love Jesus, then you might as well do it because you're really not doing it as far as he's concerned. I hope I'm making this simple. You know, God had to make it simple for me, believe me. For you have been born again, not to life that quickly ends. Your new life will last forever because it comes from eternal living word of God. The scripture says people are like grass. Their beauty is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flower fades. And some of us, you know, I remember last week, a real good friend of mine I've known for a long time said, you know we're going to be 80. I don't know about the rest of you, but I it snuck up on me. Hello? <laughs> so, Galatians tells us that I might live for God. 
My old self was crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ that lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In Psalms, we find a few things that really help. If we ask God, Psalms 119, verse 18, open my eyes to see the wonderful truths of your instructions. Thank him even when he stomps all over your toe. Thank you when he makes you mad and say, I don't want to read that anymore. And then he brings you back again. Help me to understand the meaning of your commandments and I will meditate on your wonderful deeds. 119.27 Fear of the Lord is the foundation of true wisdom. All who obey his commandments will grow in wisdom and praise him forever. Psalms 111. Verse 10, keep me from lying to myself. Keep me from lying to myself. Give me the privilege of knowing your instructions. Verse 29, Paul says over in Romans, so letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It can never obey God's law, and it never will. Why those are still under the control of their sinful nature, they can never please God. Are we living for ourselves? Does our action really prove it? Do not waste time arguing over godless ideas, old wives' tales, Training yourself to be godly. Physical training is good, but the training of godliness is much better. Promised benefits in this life and the life can come. Job says, we have studied life and found this is to be true. Listen to my counsel and apply it to yourself. You can make this choice by a loving God, you obeying him and committing yourself firmly to him. This is the key of life, Moses told us. Jesus says, I want all of your heart, not just part of it. I don't want lip service. Show me. Pastor Crane had a woman come into her office and she said, I want a divorce from my husband. I tell you, he is the most meanest guy I've ever been around. I can't stand to be with him anymore. I want to get rid of him. But I don't want to just get rid of him. I want to make him suffer like I've had to suffer. I want him to be hurt. So pastor thought for a minute, and he said, I got a good idea. I want you, for the next two months, to go home and act like you really love him. Like he really means something to you. Give him a praise for the, his decent traits. Do everything you can to show kindness and cooperation and generous. Spare nothing to show him how much you love him and how much he means to you and how you enjoy him. When you've convinced him you love him with an undying love and he can't live without you, then you drop the bomb. Tell him you're getting a divorce. That'll really hurt him. With a gleam in her eye and a smile on her face, she says, beautiful, beautiful. That'll teach him a lesson. So she went home with enthusiasm And she started treating him with kindness, listening, giving, respect, joining together, sharing. About two and a half months went by, and Pastor Crane hadn't heard from her. So he called her up, and he said, Well, are you ready to get your divorce? She said, 
divorce. I don't want a divorce. I've discovered I really love him. What makes the difference? Her actions changed her feelings. The ability to love is established not so much on fervent promises that I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. But I won't do that. Even. That's not what it really establishes. It is often repeated deeds. That's what makes the difference. Let's sing our song. Okay, we got to switch it back. <laughs> 